I would like to give you an overview of a large-scale quantum computer, but I would also like to talk about magic state distillation. So this first part of the talk may be already familiar to some of you, but don't worry, there will be some new stuff about distillation later on. So the goal is to look at useful quantum computations, something that you cannot do on a classical computer. And a circuit for such a computation could look something like this. So 100 qubits are already enough to do classically intractable computations, but these computations tend to be very long possibly taking several hours or even days to execute. Now here at QEC, many of you are familiar with the process how to construct a computer that can run such a long computation. So you start with a bunch of physical ingredients like semiconductors and superconductors, and you combine them to a big quantum computing chip, hopefully not like this because those are just two pictures of IBM's 16 qubit chip next to each other. <laughs> but if we pretend that it is a large scale quantum computer, with our 100 qubit computation in mind, we probably don't want to be worrying too much, too much about semiconductors and superconductors, and so we tend to make an approximation and think of our physical qubits as two-level systems, or we tend to think of our physical systems as two-level systems, as qubits. This is not entirely accurate, but it's an approximation that helps us think about systems with hundreds of qubits. Of course, as you all know, 100 qubits are not enough to run our 100 qubit computation because these are faulty physical qubits. They tend to decohere on the order of perhaps microseconds. So what we do next is we combine lots of those to error-corrected logical qubits that actually survive to the very end of the computation. And it's hundreds of these things that you need to run your 100 qubit computation. So potentially hundreds of thousands of logical, uh, hundreds of thousands of physical qubits. And at this point, you certainly don't want to be worrying too much about semiconductors and superconductors, but you probably don't want to be thinking in terms of physical qubits and stabilizer measurements either. To construct a large-scale quantum computer, it might be useful to have a framework that captures the essence of logical qubits and logical operations using only simple concepts, just like physical qubits capture the essence of your physical components using only two-level systems. Now, this talk is about such a framework, and the way I draw these things, it looks a bit like a board game, which is also the way I would like to introduce to you this framework, as a board game where the board corresponds to your array of physical qubits, and the pieces that you can place on the board correspond to surface code patches, logical qubits. Our goal will be to use the rules of the game to implement our 100 qubit computation. The game is played on a board partitioned into a number of tiles, and each tile corresponds to d squared physical qubits, where d is the code distance. So here it's five, but typically it's a larger number, depending on how much error correction you need. The pieces that you can place on the board are patches. Patches represent qubits, and there are two types of patches, four-corner patches and six-corner patches. Four-corner patches represent one qubit, with, and they have four corners and four edges. They have two dashed edges and two solid edges. Each dashed edge of a patch represents the qubit's Pauli x operator, and each solid edge represents the qubit's Pauli z operator. Now, with surface codes, this just corresponds to surface code patches with dashed and solid edges as rough and smooth boundaries or X and Z boundaries. So when I draw these surface code patches, then these circles are physical qubits, and these yellowish faces are Z stabilizers, these grayish faces are X stabilizers. Now these patches come in different shapes and sizes. For instance, this rectangular patch in the bottom left corner, or this patch in the top right corner where a Z edge and an X edge are on the same side of the patch. I won't be drawing these poly labels anymore, just know that dashed edges are X operators and solid edges are Z operators. And finally, there are these six corner patches. They occupy two tiles, but also represent two qubits with the first qubits poly X and Z operators in these top two edges, and the second qubits poly operators in the bottom two edges. These patches won't be too important. We'll just use them in one specific context later on. So that's the board and the pieces that you can place on the board, but what are the actual rules of the game? There's a certain set of operations that you can perform, and some of these actions have a time cost associated with them, while others don't. So there's this little clock over here counting the time steps. The idea is that one time step roughly corresponds to D code cycles. We'll associate a time step to all operations that, with service codes, have a time cost that scales with the code distance, and no time step with operations that do not scale with the code distance. So that's why it's only roughly equivalent to D code cycles. So the first set of operations are initializations. You can put patches on the board by initializing them in zero or plus. So in the Z eigenstate or in the X eigenstate, uh, plus one eigenstate. With surface codes, this is just done by initializing all physical qubits in zero or plus. Um, this is something that doesn't scale with the code distance, so we don't associate a time step with it. 
You can initialize six corner patches in 00, 0 and plus plus and by in yeah just the same way. And you can also initialize four corner patches in states that are not 0 or plus. But when you do that, there's a certain probability that an error will occur. So for instance, one state we'll be interested in initializing is this magic state over here, 0 plus e to the i pi over 4, 1. But uh, for concreteness, let's say when we do that, there's a probability of 10 to the minus 4 that there'll be a Pauli error, and we'll initialize one of these three states instead. And we will not know when this happens. With service codes, this corresponds to a protocol called stain injection. There's actually several protocols for that. For instance, this one by uh, Andrew Landahl and Kieran Ryan Anderson, where you start with a physical magic state in the middle and some stabilizer state around it, and then you switch to the stabilizer configuration corresponding to the surface code, uh, to the full surface code patch, and you measure it for three code cycles. Now, there are other state injection schemes, for instance, the one by Ying Li, but state injection is not a fault tolerant procedure, so the time to do it doesn't scale with the code distance, and again, we don't associate a time step with it. Next up are measurements. You can measure patches in the X or Z basis, and this is also the only way to remove patches from the board. For instance, this zero patch in the top right corner, if we measure it in the Z basis, the outcome will be plus one, and the patch will be gone. Or we can measure these two patches in the X or Z basis, the measurements will have some outcome, and the patches are gone. With surface codes, this just corresponds to measuring all physical qubits in the Z or X basis, so again, doesn't scale with the code distance, no time step associated with it. The interesting operations are the next two ones. If you have two patches placed in neighboring tiles, you can use a two-patch measurement to measure the products of the two operators that are next to each other. For instance, in this case, we have two patches in neighboring tiles, and we can use a two-patch measurement, and the patches Z operators are next to each other, so we can use a two-patch measurement to measure the Pauli product operator Z times Z. And this takes one time step. So with surface codes, this corresponds to the measurement protocol of lattice surgery. The way it works is you start with your two surface code patches, and then you just switch the stabilizer configuration to this one, so you kind of fuse these patches together. And you can, so because you introduce new stabilizers, you measure these stabilizers for decode cycles to account for measurement errors. You can think of the outcome of the Z times Z measurement as the product of the three stabilizers highlighted in red. Using these kind of two-patch measurements, you can also measure other poly product operator. Oh, I, I should say that these poly product measurements, they are a way to generate entanglement between qubits. So for instance, what happens in this case is that we start in the plus plus state, 0, 0, plus 0, 1, plus 1, 0, plus 1, 1. If the outcome of the ZZ measurement is plus 1, we project into this state, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. If it's minus 1, we end up in this state. Both are entangled Bell states. So, we can also measure other poly product operators. For instance, in this case, this top patch's X edge is adjacent to the bottom patch's Z edge, so we can use a two-patch measurement to measure X times Z between those two patches. Again, it's lattice surgery, but the stabilizer configuration looks a bit different. It has this kind of, these mixed stabilizers. This is a dislocation line in, uh, in the surface code. And you can also measure operators involving the Y operator of qubits. For instance, in this case, the bottom patch's Z edge is adjacent to both the top cu qubit's X and Z edge. And because Y is the product of X and Z, you can use a two-patch measurement to measure Y times Z bet between those two patches. Again, it's lattice surgery, but the stabilizer configuration involves this five-qubit twist defect. What's even more interesting is that you can use multi-patch measurements to measure the product of any number of poly operators. Uh, so if, the way it works is the following. If you have some unoccupied tiles, you can initialize an ancilla patch, which only survives for one time step. But during this time step, you can measure the product of any number of Pauli operators that are next to this patch. For instance, we can measure this four qubit Pauli operator, y1 times x3 times z4 times x5, uh, using this, mul this multi-patch measurement. And after the measurement, the patch will be gone. Now, the way this is done with surface codes was described by Austin Fowler and Craig Kidney last year. Uh, basically, the way it works is in the ancilla region, you initialize all qubits in the plus state, and then you kind of fuse all of these patches together. You do basically multiple lattice surgeries at the same time. Then you measure these qubits in the X basis again. So it's multiple lattice surgeries at the same time. The last two operations are fairly easy to understand. You can change the shape of patches by moving their edges or corners. If you move the edge of a patch and the patch becomes bigger, then it takes one time step because it involves measuring new stabilizers. If it becomes smaller, it takes no time steps because it just corresponds to a bunch of single qubit measurements. Uh, 
You can also move edges around corners like this, and you can also move the corners themselves to change the shape of a patch, which also takes one time step. So these are all the operations. We can put patches on the board by initializing them in zero plus or a faulty magic state. We can remove them from the board by measuring them in X or Z. We can measure Pauli product operators through two patch and multi patch measurements, and we can change the shape of patches. Our goal now is to use these operations to implement our 100 qubit quantum circuit, and a popular gate set for these circuits is Clifford plus T, but I really like to express my circuits in terms of Pauli product rotations, e to the minus i p phi, where p is a Pauli product operator, so that's the thing in the box here, and phi is a rotation angle. So in this sense, the S gate, the phase gate, is a z pi over 4 rotation. The Hadamard gate is a product of three rotations, z pi over 4 times x pi over 4 times z pi over 4. The CNOT gate is also a Clifford gate, so it can also be expressed in terms of pi over 4 rotations, but it's a two qubit gate, so it involves this two qubit rotation here, z times x pi over 4. So this big box means that the Pauli operator is z times x. And then there are two single qubit rotations, z minus pi over 4 and x minus pi over 4. And finally, the T gate is a z pi over 8 rotation. So a generic four qubit circuit could look something like this. You have a bunch of T gates. These are these green boxes, the z pi over 8 rotations. A bunch of Clifford gates, these orange boxes, the pi over 4 rotations, and a bunch of measurements at the end of the circuit. Measurements are blue boxes with the Pauli operator in the box specifying the basis of the measurement. The first thing I like to do is get rid of all the orange boxes by commuting all these Clifford gates to the end of the circuit. The reason why this can be done is that Clifford gates map polys onto other polys. So if you want to move an orange box past another, another box, you just need to check whether the two polys in the boxes commute or not. If they don't, you multiply them together. For instance, this x minus pi over 4 rotation, if I want to move it past the z pi over 8, these two don't commute, so I multiply them together, turns the z rotation into a y minus pi over 8 rotation. I can use the same trick to absorb pi over 4 rotations into measurements, changing the basis of the measurement in just the same way. So for instance, these x pi over 4 rotations turn z measurements into y measurements. When I do this, I can also turn single qubit operations into multi qubit operations. So for instance, this x11 z pi over 4 rotation, when I, want to, when I commute it past the z pi over 8, it turns it into a y11z pi over 8, so a multi-qubit rotation. And single qubit measurements can turn into multi-qubit measurements. So I can continue doing this with all my pi over 4 rotations until I'm left with a circuit that only involves pi over 8 rotations and Pauli product measurements. So any circuit can be written as a sequence of Pauli product pi over 8 rotations and Pauli product measurements. So let's say we do this to our 100 qubit quantum circuit and we find that it's a sequence of 10 to the 8 Pauli product pi over 8 rotations. Now 100 qubits and 10 to the 8 T gates, that's for instance what Ryan Babish and co-authors found for classically intractable Hubbard model simulations. So now we need to go through all of these pi over 8 rotations, these Pauli product rotations, but I really only showed you how to do Pauli product measurements. And that's of course where magic states enter. So if you want to perform a P pi over 8 rotation, what you can do is you can take a magic state and measure the Pauli product operator P times Z. Depending on the measurement, there might be a Clifford correction, or this, but this is just a pi over 4 rotation that you can commute to the end of the circuit, so it's nothing to worry about. Now, because we can only initialize faulty magic states, but we need good magic states to go through our 10 to the 8 pi over 8 rotations without any errors, we'll need magic state distillation to generate good magic states. So with that in mind, an intuitive way to construct a large-scale quantum computer is to partition it into a block of tiles that you use to produce magic states through magic state distillation, this orange distillation block here, and a block of tiles that stores the 100 data qubits of your computation and consumes magic states through Pauli product measurements to advance the computation. That's the data block in blue. So this thing is an example of a four-qubit quantum computer. And let's for now treat distillation as some black box that produces one magic state every five time steps. <coughs> if our four qubit quantum computation started with this x, one, y, z, pi over eight rotation, what we would have to do is wait for five time steps for a magic state to be produced. Here it is. And now we consume it by following the circuit. We measure the Pauli product operator x, one, y, z times z using a multi-patch measurement. And then we continue doing the same thing for the next pi over 8 rotation. So this is a four qubit quantum computer that executes one pi over 8 rotation after the other using five time steps per rotation until you reach the end of the computation. What I want to do now is show you a bunch of designs for data blocks and distillation blocks, starting with data blocks. 
In principle, the thing shown here can be used as a data block, but it's a bit wasteful with space. It uses four tiles for each qubit. You can do much better than that. For instance, using this thing over here, which uses roughly half as many qubits, uh, to be more precise, it stores n qubits using 2n plus square root of 8n plus 1 tile. Uh, the way it does that is it uses six corner patches. Remember, six corner patches represent two qubits, with the first qubits poly operators in these left two edges, and the second qubits poly operators in the right two edges. So if a magic state is produced in some adjacent distillation block, it can be consumed in just one time step by measuring the appropriate poly product operator. And every poly product operator can be measured here, for instance, uh, this operator involving the y operator of the first qubit, x operator of the second qubit, z operator of the 12th qubit, and so on. If you want to s save even more space, you can use a data block that looks like this. Here we kind of store two qubits using three tiles, or n qubits using 1.5n plus three tiles, and we do that by storing these qubits in the square patches. Now the problem with that is that only the z operator of each patch is accessible by multi-patch measurements. And every x operator is kind of buried in between patches. So we'll need to do something about that. And the consequence of that will turn out to be that it can take up to nine time steps to consume a magic state in this data block. But you save space. So le let me show you why that is. Here's an example of a six qubit data block with some adjacent a distillation block, which we still treat as a black box. If our six qubit computation starts with this z-type pyruvate rotation, well, that's easy. It only, only involves z operators that we can do right away by just measuring z11, zzz times z. Done. <laughs> now, the next operation is something that involves x operators. In, all, in order to perform that one, we'll need to rotate some of the patches in order to make the x operators accessible. So to be more precise, we'll need to rotate patches or qubits 2, 3, 4, and 5. This can be done using patch deformation. It's basically a three-point turn. You uh, move the edge down there, which takes one time step. You move this corner down, which takes another time step. You move this edge down, takes no time steps because the patch became smaller. You move it back up again, a third time step, and you move these ones up too. And then you repeat the same process for patch number four. So a rotation takes three time steps. And then you can measure the poly product operator, x, 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 z, times z. Now, the worst case scenario are rotations involving the y operator, because there's basically no way we can make the y operator accessible here. There's just not enough space. But you can get around that by basically doing this. You introduce an identity into the circuit, a pi over 4 rotation, followed by an, an identical minus pi over 4 rotation. And you choose these rotations in a way that when you commute them past the pi over 8 rotation, all the y's turn into x's or z's. So now all you have to do is you also have to execute these pi over 4 rotations, which you can do by following this circuit, which tells you to initialize a qubit on the zero basis and measure z times y to execute the z pi over 4 rotation, and then measure x1, xz times y to measure to execute this pi over 4 rotation. And then you're just left with a pi over 8 rotation involving only z's and x's, but that you already know how to do. You rotated a bunch of patches in the top row, a bunch of patches in the bottom row, and you're done. And this is the worst case scenario, which is the reason why it can take up to nine time steps to execute a pi over eight rotation. So those were the two data blocks that I wanted to show you. Now let's talk about distillation blocks. Magic state distillation is the short computation that you'll be repeating over and over and over again. So it's really worth optimizing it. And perhaps like many of you, I used to think about magic state distillation as something that is based on an, on an error correcting code with a transversal T gate. But nowadays, I really prefer to think of distillation purely in terms of circuits. Actually, especially after Earl Campbell showed me how he thinks about his scintillation protocols. So the way I think about distillation nowadays is the following. If you express your circuits in terms of sequences of pi over eight rotations, there are certain sequences that are equivalent to the identity, to doing nothing. Some of these sequences are trivial, for instance, this one where you have some pi over 8 rotation followed by an identical minus pi over 8 rotation. But other sequences are non-trivial, like this one. Here you have 16 pi over 8 rotations. All of them are different, all of them mutually commute, and yet they are equivalent to doing nothing. So for the experts, you can obtain such, such sequences using triorthogonal matrices or phase polynomials that always evaluate to zero. Now, if you have such a sequence, then if, I, if you multiply this with one single qubit pi over 8 rotation, you get this 
equality, which tells you that these 15 pi of age rotations are equivalent to just doing one pi of age rotation. So if you feed five plus states into the circuit, what it should produce is one magic state, well, up to a Clifford correction, but that doesn't matter, and four plus states. But because you, you use 15 pi of age rotations, and all of these pi of age rotations act non-trivially on these four qubits, you can use them to check for errors. So if we measure these four qubits that should be in the plus state, in the X basis, then all of the measurement outcomes should be plus one. So the protocol is that you go through these 15 pi of eight rotations using faulty magic states, then you measure these four qubits in the X basis. If any of these measurement outcomes is minus one, then you've detected an error. You throw everything away and you start again. If the outcomes are plus one, you've distilled a magic state. In order to see by how much you reduce the error, you can just consider a very simplified error model where every time you perform a pi of eight rotation, there is a chance that you'll perform the rotation with an additional Pauli error. So for instance, if only one pi over eight rotation, only this pi over eight rotation fails in the entire circuit, then this will produce a Z Pauli error, which will commute with all of these pi over eight rotations, but flip this measurement. So we will be able to detect it. Now that's, not, that's an error that's actually not too bad. This error would be worse because this one produces a uh, this, one not all, this one flips the output state, which is bad because it spoils our qubit. But it also flips, thankfully, these two X measurements, so we'll be able to detect the error. Now, for if two rotations fail, that works too. So, for instance, in this case, this Z error will flip the output state, but these two Z errors will flip this X measurement. This X measurement will be flipped, twi will be flipped twice, which is bad because then we'll, be, we'll not be able to detect the error. This X measurement will also be flipped twice, but this X measurement will be flipped once, so again, we can detect the error. However, there are some combinations of three pi over eight rotations that if they fail, they produce an undetected error. So for instance, here, this Z flip flips the output qubit, but all of these measurements are flipped twice. So this will produce an undetected error on the output magic state. And there are 35 of those combinations, which is why, kind of why people say that the output error why 15 to 1 distillation reduces the error from p to 35, p to the third, to leading order. So for instance, if our physical error rate was 10 to the minus 3, we could reduce it to 10 to the minus 8. If it's 10 to the minus 4, it goes down to 10 to the minus 11, and so on. So let me show you, let me first show you a naive way of implementing this 15 to 1 distillation protocol, and later on I'll show you how to do it perhaps more efficiently. So the first thing I do is I absorb this, these four pi of eight rotations into the, initial mat into the initial plus states to turn them into initial magic states. Now I have a circuit of 11 pi of eight rotations, and I can just ex execute it by following the circuit. I initialize these five qubits, one, two, three, four, five, one plus state and four faulty magic states. And in principle, we could go through the circuit executing pi of eight rotations the way I showed you before, but the problem with that is that with a 50% probability, uh, these pi over eight rotations will turn into pi over four corrections. These can be commuted to the end of the circuit, but then they turn single qubit measurements into poly product measurements, which take longer. And we want to avoid that. So one way around that is to use this circuit instead, an autocorrect pi of eight rotation, which kind of applies the Clifford correction whenever it's necessary. The way it works is that you initialize a magic state and a zero state, and then you measure P times Z, and at the same time you measure Z times Y between the magic state and the zero state. Depending on the outcome of the P times Z measurement, you measure this zero qubit in the X or Z basis, basically either applying a Clifford correction or not. And this takes just one time step. So you can go through this entire protocol in 11 time steps. You measure these uh, qubits one, two, three, and four in the X basis. If the outcomes are plus one, you've distilled a magic state using 11 tiles for 11 time steps, or in other words, using 11 D squared physical data qubits for roughly 11 D code cycles. Now this was 15 to one distillation, but there are actually many more protocols that basically look the same way. They are also kind of sequences of Z type pi of eight rotations. So let's for now stick with this naive distillation block to see how you would use this to kind of perform a resource estimate as to how many qubits and how, how many qubits you need to go through your 100 qubit computation and how long it would take. And to get some numbers out of that, Let's consider this concrete example of the 100 qubit 10 to the 8 T gate computation. We'll assume that the physical error rate is 10 to the minus 4 under circuit level noise, that magic states, raw magic states also have an error rate of 10 to the minus 4, that one code cycle takes one microsecond, and that each tile corresponds to 2D squared physical qubits, also taking measurement and SILAS 
into account. And our goal will be to go through the computation in a way that the, er the probability of any error occurring during the computation that it stays below 1%. Let me show you what that means. So the smallest, the smallest thing that we can produce using the blocks that I showed you before is this one, where you have a compact data block which stores 100 qubits using 153 tiles, but can only consume one magic state every nine time steps. And this tiny thing over here, that's our distillation block, which uses 11 tiles and can produce one magic state every 11 time steps. We should check that the output error of that distillation is good enough to execute 10 to the 8 T gates, and 10 to the minus 11 is certainly good enough. So in total, this is a thing that, com that consists of 164 tiles and finishes the computation in 11 times 10 to the 8 time steps. In order to find out how many qubits and code cycles this corresponds to, we need to know what the code distance is. And for that, we can kind of use this estimate for the logical error rate under, surface, uh, under circuit level noise. So that's the, that's the logical error rate per code cycle per surface code patch. And we need 164 of those patches to survive for 11 times 10 to the 8 D code cycles. So we want, basically, we just want this quantity to be below 1%. And we find that distance 13 is good enough. So in our estimate, these are 55 and a half thousand physical qubits, and the computation finishes in four hours. If you want to speed up the computation, you can just add another distillation block. Now you'll be producing magic states twice as fast, but your data block can actually not cope with that because uh, it cannot consume them this fast, so this will be your bottleneck. Still, you uh, increase the number of qubits only by a little, but the computational time drops by 45 minutes in our estimate. If you want to speed up beyond that, you should use the other data block that we had that stores 100 qubits using 231 tiles, but can consume a magic state in every time step. And the rest of your quantum computer would be kind of comprised of 11 distillation blocks that effectively produce one magic state in every time step. Um, so in, in here you kind of, you increase your space cost, you basically double your space cost to 123,000 physical qubits, but your computational time drops a lot. So I'm just saying that these kind of things can be very good space-time trade-offs. So that's how you could construct a large-scale quantum computer. Now let's talk a bit more about magic state distillation. So magic state distillation, for some reason, has a very bad reputation. Somehow there's this misconception that you construct a large-scale quantum computer with service codes, and almost all qubits in the quantum computer will be used for magic state distillation. But even for our kind of uh, unoptimized implementation, this doesn't really seem to be true. Let me show you a few tricks that you can use to uh, further decrease the overhead of magic state distillation by a lot. So the first thing that I like to do is get rid of state injection. Now the annoying thing about state injection was that we had this Clifford correction that we always had to perform and in our distillation block this kind of implied that we need to use these extra qubits. So it would be nice to do this without a Clifford correction on the logical level. Uh, and the reason why you have this Clifford correction state injection is basically because you're kind of following the circuit. You want to execute a T gate on a bunch of logical qubits. So you start with a physical magic state. You grow it into a logical magic state. So that's this part. And then you entangle this patch with the rest of, the sy of your system. You measure the patch, and then there's an S gate Clifford correction. But it turns out that if you just switch the order of these operations, and instead you start with a logical Pauli eigenstate, you entangle this big patch with the rest of your system, and then you perform what I call a faulty T measurement. So you kind of you shrink down the patch to a physical qubit, apply a T gate, and then measure it in the X basis. Then there's only a Pauli correction instead of a Clifford correction, which is much nicer. So this part is what I kind of what I refer to as uh, to a to as a faulty T measurement. The way it is done with surface codes is fairly simple. You start with your D by D patch. You perform a bunch of single qubit X measurements to shrink it down to a D by one patch. You perform a bunch of single qubit Z measurements to shrink it down to a one by one patch. And now this remaining qubit, uh, on this remaining qubit, you apply a physical T gate and you measure it in the X basis. Apart from not requiring a Clifford correction, the nice thing about this is that it also only requires single qubit operations. So in many qubit platforms, two qubit gates are much worse than single qubit gates. Um, and this is also the reason why in many state injection protocols, the fidelity of, of the magic state that you produce through state injection is mostly limited by your two qubit error rates. But here you really only use single qubit operations. However, the downside is that there's this Pauli correction on the blue qubit, which depends on, on all of these measurement outcomes. 
Um, and this blue qubit might, you might have to hold on to it for a while. So you might need to store this blue qubit until you actually know the measurement results. Might be bad for some Q implementations, but good for others. But it's a thing. So if you want to use this to perform a P pi over eight rotation, you could basically follow this circuit. What it tells you to do is, so let's say we want to, we have our five qubits, we want to perform a Z1 times Z4 times Z5 pi over eight rotation. What you have to do is you initialize a plus patch in this top right corner, and then you measure P times Z. So it's again, it's just multi-patch lattice surgery. And then you perform a faulty T measurement on this plus qubit in the top right corner. So that's what this protocol tells you to do. But if we go back to the stabilizer configuration, we can actually see that this, um, this patch in the top right corner is not really required because we can, we can just transform this. We can kind of just pull in this edge to get a stabilizer configuration that is topologically equivalent and preserves the code distance. So really, instead of using d squared qubits for this, you can use just d qubits. And that's how I will draw these faulty T measurements. So if you, but if you, so th those were faulty T measurements, but if you really want to reduce the overhead of distillation, what you should do is use different code distances for different parts of your protocol. If you look at the 15 to one circuit, then you'll see that single qubit Pauli errors, not all single qubit Pauli errors are equally bad. If you have a Z or X single qubit Pauli error on qubit one, well, that's certainly bad because that's our output state. It will affect, it will affect our output state. And that's certainly something we want to avoid. If you have an X poly error on qubits two, three, four, or five, then this is probably also bad because this anti-commutes with lots of these pi eight rotations and it will not be detected by the X measurements. But if you have a Z poly error on these four qubits, it's actually not so bad because a Z poly error commutes with all of these pi eight rotations and it is detected by the X measurements. So there's really no point in using a large code distance to encode the logical Z operator of these four qubits. What you could do instead is use a dx by dx patch for qubit one and these rectangular dx by dz patches for qubits two, three, four, and five. And then you have kind of some additional space over here and over here, which you use for faulty T measurements. There's actually a third code distance that you should introduce, which is dm, the temporal code distance, which tells you how many code cycles you should use to perform your faulty T measurements. So how many code cycles you use to perform the lattice surgery. Now, the fewer code cycles you use, the higher the uncertainty will be in the outcome of this poly product measurement. So you might mess up this poly correction and turn the pi over eight rotation into a minus pi over eight rotation. But that's also fine because the distillation protocol can detect these kind of errors. So you go through this protocol executing these pi over eight rotations using faulty T measurements. Here we have four rotations that we execute. Then we execute these two, then these three, then these two, then these two. And at this point, you can already start consuming your output state to execute a pi over eight rotation. You might want to do this because you don't want the output state to block your distillation block later on so that you won't be able to, uh, to start the next round of distillation. Uh, now you might object that at this point we still don't know whether the distillation protocol will succeed or not, but there's also a way to uh, perform a pi over eight rotation where you can decide at a later point whether you wanted to perform the operation or not. And then you go to the end, you get to the end of the circuit, measure qubits uh, two, three, four, and five in the X spaces. If the outcomes are plus one, you've distilled the magic state. In order to find out what, um, wh what kind of output error rates I produce, I perform an estimate in the paper, but it's by no means any kind of rigorous simulation. I don't have any simulation on the level of physical qubits. I don't have any decoder running. What I do is I just go through the circuit and I apply single qubit Pauli errors. And every time I apply a gate, there is a chance that there's a probability that I'll have a Pauli error or a, or a Clifford error. And these probabilities depend on the code distances. So these numbers that I'm gonna show you, take them from, for what they are. They're just some rough estimate. But what I find in the estimate is that for a physical error rate of 10 to the minus four, uh, for if I choose the code distances dx, dz, and dm as nine, three, and three, then I produce magic states with an output error of 9.3 times 10 to the minus 10, which is good enough for 10 to the 8 T gates. And the space time cost of the protocol is 20,700 qubit cycles. So physical qubits times code cycles. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the only relevant cost metric for magic state distillation, the space time cost. Of course, if you want to have it in terms of the full distance, then it's 4.71 D to the third, but this number is 
relatively meaningless. What it means in this context is that if you want to produce one magic state every decode cycles, that you need to uh, use a qubit footprint equivalent to 4.71 logical qubits at full distance. Of course, this was for a physical error rate of 10 to the minus 4, which is fairly low. If you go to 10 to the minus 3, then 15 to 1 will produce something with a logical error rate of 10 to the minus 8, which is not good enough for 10 to the 8 T gates. So one thing you could do is perform two levels of distillation. And the way it works is basically the, f the same as one level of distillation. Uh, you have your five qubits here, but now you have a second set of code distances, dx2, dz2, and then there's also dm2. And the way you perform these pi over eight rotations is by using a distilled level one magic state, which comes from these level one distillation blocks that I showed you before. Uh, so in this case, we have eight of those. So the way you go through the computation is that you pull a level one magic state out of these distillation blocks, and then you use it to perform two of these pi over eight rotations. And while you do that, you can pull the next magic state out of these distillation blocks. So you have a magic state to the left and to the right. And then you perform the next two pi over rotations. And while you do that, you pull the next two magic states out of the level one blocks and use those to perform the next two pi over rotations. So you, you execute these pi over rotations using these uh, autocorrected pi over eight rotations that I showed you before that don't require a Clifford correction. So you do this until you get to the end of the circuit. And the speed at which, you go through, at which you can go through the circuit not only depends on the six code distances that characterize your level one blocks and level two blocks, but also on the number of level one blocks that you use. So the more level one blocks you use, if you use only few level one blocks, then you'll be limited by the speed at which level one states are produced. But if you use too many of those, then you'll be limited by the time it takes to perform a logical measurement by this DM2. So um, what I've shown you so far are 15 to 1 distillation protocols, but all of this actually also applies to basically almost other, all other distillation protocols. For instance, this is 20 to 4, which produces four magic states. It's also a sequence of z-type pi over 8 rotations. It looks exactly the same, but instead of five qubits, you have seven qubits. And even protocols that produce, ma produce states that perform more than just a T-gate, for instance, a CCZ state, protocols for that can also look pretty much the same. So here you have a protocol that produces a CCZ state using eight Z-type pi over eight rotations. And again, it's the same thing, but with four qubits. So I have compiled this table with lots and lots of numbers. Uh, but the way you can read this table is the following. So what this table tells you is that, for instance, there exists in my rough estimate, which is not a rigorous simulation, that there exists a, a two-level protocol where, where on the first level you use 15 to 1, on the second level you use 20 to 4, and the 20 to 4 protocol is characterized by the distances 21, 11, and 13. And there are six level 1 blocks characterized by the distances 13, 5, and 5. What this protocol does, it reduces the error rate from 10 to the minus 3 to roughly 10 to the minus 10. And the space-time cost is 1,410,000 qubit cycles per output state. Or in terms of the full distance, which is now 29, because uh, you have a higher physical error rate of 10 to the minus 3, it's 28.9 d to the third. So the message here is really that if you previously thought that uh, in a surface called quantum computer, 99.9% .9 of your qubits are used for distillation, then magic state distillation is not as costly as you think. Which you can read about in magic state distillation, not as costly as you think. <laughs> but that's not to say that surface code quantum computation is not costly. It is very costly. But in my opinion, this is not mainly due to the fact that distillation is costly, but rather that if you want to perform a 100 qubit computation, you need to store 100 logical qubits. And with surface codes, you'll need a lot of physical qubits to do that. So if you want to read more about large-scale quantum computing, then you can read A Game of Surface Codes, Large-Scale Quantum Computing with Lattice Surgery. And with that, we've reached the end of the talk. Let's take questions. Thanks very much, Daniel, for that wonderful talk. Are there any questions? Who would like to go first? Maybe, maybe Daniel? Yeah, so I didn't understand what was going on with this faulty T-gate. So if you do that, isn't, I mean, the T-gate is not protected, so what, why isn't it a logical, high logical error rate? Uh, no, no, it, uh, so you perform the T-gate, and the error rate of this T-gate is still the physical error rate. That's correct because you use 
it's just that, um, so in principle, what you do is instead of having to perform a logical Clifford correction, which requires some overhead that scales with the code distance, you shift it to a physical Clifford correction, which has an area that, oh, sorry, which does not scale with the co code distance. I, yeah, I understand, but, but, but then you're doing a, a gate with a, but then, but then it becomes a logical T gate, right? And that's correct. I mean, you add it with a high logical error rate. So that's why, correct. Why is that? So you, you, no matter how you perform logical T gates in surface codes, you're always limited by your physical error rate. The question is just, uh, do you have your, your faulty T gate in the beginning of the circuit or in the end of the circuit? This is only something that you can do on the first level of distillation, right? Oh, I see. This is just on the second level of distillation. distillation you don't use that. You cannot use that. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So o only when you perform these faulty—that's why it's faulty. Only when you perform faulty T gates, you can use this kind okay, of. Okay, sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you were doing it on the logical data. Right, right. No, absolutely not. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, that was a great talk. Um, I actually want to follow up on Daniel's question. So you showed this protocol for doing the uh, essentially injection of the T measurement, the T gate followed by measurement. Um, am I correct in thinking that before you do the measure, the, the very last measurement, so you've done a T gate, but you might have to do um, T dagger. Exactly. Um, so that decision depends on having done a complete syndrome processing up until that point? Correct. Okay. So, yeah. Um, it might be useful, it might not be useful, but the thing that really d um, the thing that really decreases the overhead of distillation is not necessarily this part. This is something that I just wanted to share because it only uses single qubit operations. But um, using reduced code distances for the other parts of the protocol is what decreases the overhead mostly. Any more questions? I think hmm? oh, we've got several. Okay, um, why don't we go in the back of the middle first? So when you compare a circuit into like the T gates and also with multi patch uh, measurement, like when you perform the multi patch uh, measurement, all the data blocks are occupied. Sorry. When you perform the multi patch measurement, all the data blocks are occupied. or like. Uh, In what sense occupied? Yeah, uh, the data qubits, the logical data qubits. So. Uh, if I have logical data qubits? Like when you perform a multi-patch measurement, like uh, the I, Z, Z, I, whatever uh -huh. measurement, like all the all of them, like from one to five, all of them are occupied, so you cannot perform other operations. Oh. So there's this free space of, I mean, there's nothing occupied that, um, oh, I rotated the patches wrong, but uh, the, the, so do you, do you mean that, was what, which part of here is? So when you perform like the multi, uh, uh, like uh, poly measurement, uh, the qubit one, two, three, four, five, all of them like uh, have to be there to, uh, to enable to perform the multi, uh, like qubit measurement, right? Uh, like you, if you consider if you have a hundred logical qubits, uh -huh. are you going to place them on a, like a logical linear array? Right. Like. Uh, and also, like, how about uh, the performance of this, uh, like, multi-patch measurement compared to a less uh, patch measurement? Ah, uh, so, yeah, this, uh, and that's a good question. That's something I get often. Like, do I have to, do I have to increase the code distance if I have like this very long patch? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, that's one of the questions. Um, now, so. The answer is actually no, because this is something that you do anyway when you, when you fix the code distance of your entire protocol. The code distance depends on the total number of qubits that you have in your uh, quantum computer. So the, uh, the distance that you use goes kind of logarithmically with the overall space-time cost of your computation. So it's something that you take into account anyway when you fix your code distance. But I think the logical error rate should be different, right? The threshold may not change. But the logical error rate may be different. Um, why? Uh, like because more logical qubits are involved in this. So uh, w when you go through this computation, you're kind of trying to never actually have any errors, right? So you try to have the probability to be um, 
to be such that you never kind of deal with errors. So, so maybe, maybe one thing that you mean is that errors can be more harmful than others? Uh, no, they're probably not. <laughs> Sorry. And there's okay. a question behind from Ken. Yeah, actually, I, ba I basically have very similar questions to the last question. So the first part is there's really no penalty. Like, how does the size of my multi-patch change my distance? Uh, you need to... You need to you need to fix the distance in the beginning of the protocol of, of the for the, for the for the size of multi patch I want to do basically yes okay and it goes logarithmically yeah and then the second question I mean essentially you can look if you have a surface code computation it's specified by some space time diagram right what exactly it looks like whether there's like this long patch or it's kind of shaped in some weird form it doesn't really uh, matter what matters is what's the overall space time volume that your computation occupies. Okay. And the overall space-time volume is what specifies the code distance that you should use. Right, and then along those ideas, uh, like a similar question also related to this very same diagram, is you could imagine that maybe I would want to, in parallel, do a multi-patch measurement with one, four, five, and two, three. And in your game, do you like look at this like cost of parallelism versus serialization? Um, so, okay, so uh, this is for the distillation protocol, this kind of very fixed computation, but um, parallelization is something that you can do, but um, the cost of that will very much depend on your specific computation. So there's always a way to, uh, well, the thing I can say is that what you can always execute in parallel are um, pyrite rotations that mutually commute. These if you have a sequence of private rotations that all mutually commute, they can in principle be executed in parallel. But the most naive thing that you can always do has a kind of a linear space-time trade-off. You use twice as many qubits to execute two private rotations at the same time. Then depending on the specific uh, locality of those operations, perhaps you can do more. Thanks. Okay, maybe this time for one final question. Who'd like to ask the final question of QEC19? Maybe Ben, ben Brown. <laughs> Yeah, that was a really good talk, Daniel. Um, Thanks. Do you know how this compares with the triangular codes of Yoda and Kim? Like, could you, could you do this with triangular tiles as well? Uh, so, them? yeah, I've been trying to come up with, with a way to use them efficiently. Now, the, the problem with triangular codes is that um, only one poly, so a triangular code has three sides, and the X, Y, and Z poly operator are on different sides of the triangle. So every time you want to make the other one accessible, you kind of, uh, you have to rotate it. And this actually takes some extra space because you have a triangle that you need to rotate. And um, once you do that, it's never clear to me if you kind of still have the advantage of the triangle being very, very compact. Uh, now, then what would be really nice would be actually color codes because color codes are also tr compact triangles but they have X, Y, and Z on the same side of the patch. So these you don't need to rotate at all and you don't need to have any, don't need to put any thought into how to make any poly operators accessible. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so let's thank Daniel once more. <laughs>